Welcome to the September town hall. Oh man, September is a good month and this town hall is stacked. So Redwood V8 was released earlier this week. We redid our upgrade guide, which I'm excited to show off. We have background jobs that are baked in to the code. So in July's town hall, Rob gave you a sneak peek, but in today's town hall, he'll give you the final walkthrough. And then Toby is sharing some of the latest and greatest features with RSC and FSR. And spoiler alert, he has server actions working within Redwood. And then we also have Aaron from BuildPass. So BuildPass is an AI powered construction site management software based out of Australia. And it is one of Redwood's best success stories. They have millions of rows of content within their database. It's just evidence that Redwood is not only performant, but built for scale. So Aaron will be sharing some of their story. I've included timestamps in the description below if you want to jump around or if you're returning to reference a specific part of Town Hall, but let's get into it. We've teased Redwood V8 for a couple of months, but now it's officially been released. So a few highlights, there's easier support for SSR and RSC. You can simply run the following command, yarn Redwood experimental setup streaming SSR and yarn Redwood experimental setup RSC. Storybook has officially moved over to Vite. We switched the framework over to Vite in version six, but we were still shipping with Webpack in order to support Storybook. And now that Storybook is on Vite too, it not only makes Storybook faster, but completely removes Webpack. And you can still run the same command that I know I love, Yarn Redwood Storybook. We've moved Docker support out of experimental and provided complete support for it, meaning you can deploy your Redwood app anywhere that supports Docker and the command is easy. Yarn Redwood Setup Docker. This might feel like a minor thing, but it's a major thing. See what I did there? We upgraded versions of React, Prisma, Vite, and a whole lot more. So upgrading is as simple as running Yarn Redwood Upgrade. And I know that's one of the things that I personally love about Redwood is that it handles all the package upgrades for you. You don't have to worry about how the rest of your code is affected because Redwood takes care of all that for you. And if there is an issue or something you need to change within your code base, we'll tell you about it in our upgrade guide which is the next piece I wanted to highlight. You'd think I planned that transition. So this is our upgrade guide. Previously, we posted the upgrade guide within the forums, which was fine. It served the purpose that we needed it to, but now we wanted to take things to the next level. So Josh and I worked on migrating the upgrade guide into the website. Now, the cool part about this is it uses a markdown file and our experimental SSR. Now, one of the reasons that the upgrade guide was originally in the forums was for comment support. It's so important that we get your feedback as you use the code. This helps us find bugs and make the documentation better. So we built out a custom commenting system. Now I've built hundreds of web applications and it's never as easy as just add comments. Now you have a login system, but not just user accounts. You have to have a way for users to create an account, update their account, forget their password and reset their password. Of course, we already have set up commands in place that make this easy. And with SSR, we can implement auth through middleware. When someone submits a comment, they get an email update to their response and the core team gets a Slack notification. Now, uh, in discourse, as people respond, we'd have tons of comments at the top that someone would have to sift and scroll through to find what they were looking for. So. Some of these comments were no longer relevant because the core team would go through and prioritize these updates. So with this new system, as comments are resolved, the core team can go through updating the code and the upgrade guide and then hide those comments. So all you see as the end user are the relevant comments. Fancy, right? So if you wanna check out the upgrade guide code specifically, it's all open source on GitHub. Now let's take a deeper look at background jobs. Hey everybody, Rob here, and I am going to demonstrate a new feature coming out in Redwood 8.0, and that is background jobs, processing work in the background. What is a background job? So, you know, your typical request might look something like this. Request comes in, you maybe do some create user stuff, and then you're going to send a welcome email, let's say. And this is generally not the fastest process in the world, but the user now has to wait for this because this is all in line, and they get a response. But with the background job, we can shuttle some of that stuff off and run that in the background. So in this case now, the actual request is pretty quick. Create user, done. But where the welcome email would be sent now, that's shuttled off to a separate process. And this runs sort of in the background with the worker process. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So let's do a quick demo. So let's go to this sample app here. It's pretty simple. All it has is a homepage and then you can sign up. 
So I'm going to come here and sign up. And you'll see there's a weird delay there. That's the email delay. So let's take a look at how I did that. I kind of simulated that. Right now it's just sending locally, but I simulated a little delay in here. So this is the auth function that handles your sign up stuff. And this is in the sign up options section of the doc here or the, the file. And here's the handler. So this is what to do when a user signs up. In this case, we're going to create the user and then we're going to send them the welcome email and then we return the user. And I put in this promise here that waits two seconds. So it simulates a two second delay, you know, talking to a real mail server. And, and we can see these mails. We have a project here called Studio. So if you do Yarn RW Studio, this should open your browser and you get a bunch of tools over here. And one of them is the inbox. And now if I go back and sign up again, two second, but now we can see the email. So it comes into studio. We can view our emails here and they only show up here if studio itself is running. So if studio is not running, the emails just kind of go into the nether realm. But here we go. As long as it's running, we'll get to see it. So we don't want the user to have that delay. So let's put that into a background job. So we'll go back to our code here. And we're going to set up background jobs. So Yarn RW set up jobs. And it's going to do a few things for us. We'll see that it created a database table. So we have a new database table here called background job. And it's everything it needs for the background job system to work. So we'll migrate that. Create background job. And it also created a config file. So if we go into source lib jobs, you see there's a file here that built for us. So by default, you don't have to touch this at all. And this will work as you expect, but we can just quickly go through it here. So we'll see we have the job manager. And what we do is we have different adapters. So right now we only have the Prisma adapter. That means it's storing your jobs and working on them in the database via Prisma. But in theory, you could have other ones here, Redis, SQS, RabbitMQ, etc. There are some named queues you can go in. We give it a logger for logging, and then you configure workers. And we'll see those in a second where it actually runs your job. You're going to give it a little bit of configuration. And then this exports a scheduler. So this is what you're going to use to say, hey, I want to do this job later. And we're going to see that in a minute. All right. So we have jobs set up. Now we need an actual job to send the email. So let's generate one of those. So we can do yarn redwood G for generate job. And we'll say welcome email. And this is going to name this the same as that and just put job on the end. So we'll see here now we have a jobs directory and a welcome email. Right now it just exports something to the logs. You can see that it works. But we're going to put our mail here instead. So let's go to auth and we'll take this out for now. And we'll say job It's going to go there. And we'll put this in here and we'll keep that delay so we can see now that the user is not going to wait at all. There may be a delay running the job, but the user will never know. Uh, and now what we need to do is you'll notice this reference to the user email. So we need a way to get this in. So what we can do is we can pass parameters to our job. So we'll say email here. I will use that. And then we need to import the stuff that the mailer needs. So we'll come over here to auth and we'll borrow this, put this in the job now. And that's it. So you'll see the job just uses the this create job function on the jobs thing that we exported in the config file. And it has a name of the queue that this job will go into and then a function called perform. And this is what you actually want to do, want the job to do. This is where your logic goes. So now back here, we will import. Remember, we created that schedule card later, so we'll import that. And then we'll import the job itself. So it is welcome email job. And then we'll go back down to our handler where we create the user. And now we're going to say later, welcome email job. And it's going to be user.email. And when you do the arguments, you pass them in an array here because the perform can take as many arguments as you want. And this way they just all are one arg passed to this function. So the welcome email job we want to run later. And here are the parameters it needs. So now let's save that. And we'll restart our server because we created the job setup stuff since we last ran it. So we'll just restart that to pick it up. And now when we sign up, now we return instantly. So where's the job? Did the job run? What's going on here? If we look at, let's run console 
yarn rwc for console. We can run commands in the context of the app, including access in the database. So we'll say db background job find many. And there's our job. So it's the welcome email job. And you can see that the args it got, it got my email address. It's in the default queue and it's going to run at, and this is the time that it went into the database. So basically like run as soon as possible, but it still isn't running, right? We need to actually run uh, the workers. So we have a new command for that, yarn rw jobs work. And this will then look in the database, find jobs and start running them one at a time. And you can see there. So here it picked it up, job one started, job one success. And you may have noticed there was a two, three second delay in there. So now you can see there. So I just signed up with user 14 and there's email 14. So it came in and you'll see now it's just, if we let it run, I can just log out and create another user again. And if we watch here, there's our email. When you're in that mode, yarn rw jobs work. It's just going to run here forever looking for jobs. There's a couple more modes we can run this in. So we can say jobs work off, which will look for any jobs, run them, and then quit. So instead of it persistently running, it just does any outstanding jobs and stops. And there's also yarn rw jobs start. And this is more of your production interface where it starts the runners and then detaches them and closes itself. So now the worker's just running in the background persistently. So if we look at our activity monitor here, we can see RW jobs worker stars means the queue. It's running on stars, all queues. And this is the first worker. So it starts with a zero. So again, it's still running. So I can come over here and sign up. That was 16. So if we wait a second here. We should see 16 pop in. There it is. So now your worker's running in the background forever. You probably don't want that to run in, like that in dev. You'll probably forget about it. It's just sitting there sucking up CPU cycles. So you can go in here and say yarn RW jobs stop. Assuming there are some running, it'll find them and kill those processes. Now, what if we don't want to run a job right away? Like maybe we want to have a little grace period here before they get this email. We can put a delay in here. So we can say wait 300. That's 300 seconds. So now the job will go into the database right away, but the workers will wait until it's five minutes old before that actually runs them. And we can also say wait until if you want to give it a very specific date time. So now you can say, you know, in the year 3000, I want to send the millennium reminder job. <laughs> and yeah, so that's the basics of jobs. So check out the docs, tons more usage examples, including uh, what to do in production, because you want to be able to monitor them and make sure they keep running. And if something happens, if you have a bad job by mistake that, you know, kills the process or something. You want to monitor it, make sure it keeps running. There's a little bit of explanation here of how queues work and priorities. You can have jobs run before other jobs. And then it gets into all kind of details about the configuration. So all the different configuration options you can use and what we're looking to do in the future. So we've got some more features coming, recurring jobs. Right now you could have a job schedule itself at the end if you needed to recur. And uh, we talk about that in this document, but that'll be a, we'll have a native syntax for that soon. Lifecycle hooks. So before it performs, after it performs, if it succeeds, if it fails, you can kind of separate your logic out instead of having everything in one giant perform function. You can separate out those concerns into nice little manageable chunks. But yeah, that's jobs. Enjoy. Pretty sweet, right? Next up, we have Toby showing off server actions within Redwood. And this is pretty incredible because it means someone can truly build a full-fledged React server component app with all the CRUD features using Redwood. Hi, Toby here to give you the latest updates on React server component support in Redwood. I have been working on React server actions support. Uh, so React server actions is a part of React server components and it's a way for the web page to communicate with the server. So what it's usually used for is submitting forms and getting a response back. So that is what I have been working on. And on my screen here, I have the traditional kitchen sink test project that we use. If you've seen it before and have keen eyes, you might notice that there's a new blog entry up in the navigation menu. So this is a very rudimentary blog system that I built using nothing but React Server Components and React Server Actions. So it's fully powered by the new React Server Components experience. And the way it works is that it reads markdown files off of the file system, parses them, and then 
uh, shows them on the page. And to the left here, you can see that there are currently two web, uh, blog posts, one about butterflies and then the typical hello world post. So when I clicked the link there, it went and read the markdown file on disk and then parsed it to show you the content right here. It also parses the files to give you the titles uh, of the blog post to show in the navigation menu and uses the file name itself as the URL slug. So this, in this case, the file name is hello-world.md for markdown, but we don't show the md ex extension here. So this is uh, reading markdown files to show them as blog posts. We can also create new markdown, blog posts or new markdown files with the new blog post here. So this is a 100% standard HTML form. So you have a form element with an author label and an uh, input text box. So the author for this blog post is going to be me, Toby. And the body is going to be a new blog post for town hall. So now when I save this, I'm going to trigger a form, the form action. So on my form element, I have specified the action. And the action is a React server action. And this save button here is a standard uh, form submit button. So there's actually no JavaScript here, no on click handler, no on submit handler. It's just using form actions or the form action attribute uh, where I pass in a React server action. This server action is going to get the uh, form data as the input and it will be sent to the server server will see that this is a React server action and handle it accordingly. So when I click Save here, I trigger the server action on the, on the backend. It processes the form data and writes it out to a new Markdown file. And as you saw, as soon as I clicked Save, my new blog post showed up here in the navigation menu. So the way that it works is that, as I said, form action will be passed the form data and then the server will store that data uh, on disk in this case as a markdown file and then send back the RSC flight response. The flight response contains the way that the page is now supposed to render and that includes the new blog post and here it is. So we can read we can create and we can also edit blog posts. Now if we go here, it's now been edited. Of course, we can also delete blog posts. Uh, but I save that for last because this experience isn't awesome yet. So now if I delete this, oh no, errors. So we, uh, what I would like to happen here is to get a redirect back to the main blog page. But what happened instead is it's going to create a new one here quickly. Save, test, delete. It's still trying to render the test blog post, but it doesn't exist on disk anymore. So it can't read it. And that's why I get an error here. So that's one thing that we still have left to do is to implement uh, support for redirects. Another thing is if I can trigger it here is when I click, yeah, there you go. When I click on these, sometimes you get a quick flash of a loading state there. That's also, of course, something that we need to fix. And we think we can do that using a new API introduced with React 19, but we haven't uh, gotten around to it just yet. Because this, Support, full support for extra reactions just landed a, f a few days ago. And I have been working on improving it since then, but haven't gotten around to, to, the, to the render issue there uh, just yet. 
So, uh, if you want to take a look at this yourself, this is now included in the KitchenSync test project that you get when you get started with a new uh, Redwood Server Actions project. And the quickest and easiest way to do that is to go to redwoodjs.com slash server dash components. Then you end up on this page where you can just copy this command here and paste it into your terminal and off you go. So that is what I have been working on. Um, but more good news in RSD land is that we now have one more team member working on React Server Components. So Peter has joined me in my efforts and he is focusing on making the developer experience much, much better. So if you have tried out uh, React Server Components in Redwood, you know that you had to first build and then serve, essentially working with the production environment. But of course, we want to get the dev server working for React Server Components as well. So that is that is what he is working on. And he does that uh, using a new API provided by Viet called the Environments API. This will be available in the next version of Viet, version 6. And I am super excited about the work he's doing. I've seen some of it. And having hot module reloading and all the good stuff is going to be incredible. So I'm really looking forward to the work that he is doing, and I'm sure you will like it as well. That's all for my update. Thank you, and goodbye. Next up, we have Aaron from BuildPass. G'day, everyone. My name is Aaron Vanston, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of BuildPass. So BuildPass is a startup in the construction space. So I do want to call out when you see safer sites, we mean uh, safer construction sites, not websites. Um, but what we do is we do all the on-site operations for construction sites and we help digitize that entire process. So you can think about uh, workers coming on site, perhaps machinery or plant or equipment, assets, uh, the regulatory and compliance with people coming on, um, quality, defects, inspections, etc. We help with all of that. We do that in a really accessible way that um, anyone, you know, whether they barely use technology through to kind of tech savvy site managers, we help support and um, push the entire construction industry forward in the digital kind of manner as well. So right now we're Australian based. Uh, we are looking to expand overseas quite shortly. We're roughly 20-ish people. Um, some of that's mostly in Australia and some of it's also overseas with support as well. And that's kind of a bit of a, a makeup of you know, developers, about five-ish developers. We have customer success, sales, support, um, design, marketing as well that kind of help with, um, facilitate all of that. So it's a pretty, pretty awesome team to kind of be working with and kind of expanding out in the construction space, which historically has been kind of left behind in the digital sense as well. So Bill Pass itself has been using Redwood from the day dot. Um, we jumped on really early days. I think we were on version 0 0.2, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, and we've definitely kind of grown alongside of Redwood as it's you know, expanded in features and gone you know, to major versions as well. We've been quickly following along and kind of um, helping support from the guidelines and, and kind of, yeah, submitting some, some issues and helping out where we can. Um, but it's been a really awesome framework for us to scale as well. So some milestones in that time. So we, uh, I forgot to mention, but we've been out for about three years. So yeah, joining again Redwood at that kind of 0.2 for three years ago. Um, in that time, we've scaled out to 100, I think about 110,000 users. Um, not all of those of which are actively monthly, but a serious chunk of that's active users, which is amazing. Uh, we're just under 400 customers uh, during that time. Again, all in Australia, but we are looking to expand overseas. Um, and we have some random, you know, things like, you know, we have audit log tracking uh, within uh, Bill Pass itself. And we've just hit, I think, 15 million audit logs uh, other day. You know, things like um, sign-on. So within construction site, there's a concept of a daily sign-on for a worker. And that's a worker kind of entering a, a project and, and doing a bit of work on that project. And we just, we're approaching kind of one and a half million sign-ons um, of workers, you know, coming onto projects uh, just in Australia alone. So it's pretty impressive stuff. And we've essentially been able to do, do all of that uh, through scaling mostly vanilla redwood, um, which I can kind of show you kind of how it works today. So um, similar to, I think, um, 
Orders presentation a while back. We don't actually use the, the standard structure of Redwood. Um, we have a mixture of multiple clients that talk to a single core uh, Redwood API. And it's what we call our core API. And that's kind of like a full stack application that does, again, mostly the API aspect to Redwood. And we are looking to build out some kind of um, admin support crud on top of that as well. But for the most part, it's just our API itself. So Redwood manages all of our services, all the logic, all the, the kind of integrations. It does all of that really, really nicely and does it quite quickly. And then we have separate clients and UIs going off, um, consuming that as an API itself. So this is one of them today. This is our next Next.js front-end application. And we also have things like uh, React Native applications as well and you know, build out future applications on top of that API. Uh, but yeah, this is probably to help show you kind of what we do. So this is kind of like the dashboard for a construction site here. You might have things like, you know, inductions to review, things that are pending, um, and yeah, all of these different kind of you know, items and actions to kind of upfront. And then you'll, you'll notice is that we have a plethora of modules as well. So a big thing for us and also um, kind of why we chose Redwood as well is that in the construction space, there is this need to do so many bespoke and niche tasks, but also have their own kind of business logic or kind of validation logic as well. So as an example, doing an emergency on a construction site, when you trigger that, who needs to be notified? What am I showing my workers? All of these things doing to daily site diaries, capturing weather information, site attendance, machinery on site, all of these different things have these all these different requirements that a customer might have, but also just in general, the module itself is quite unique. And so for us at BuildPass, using the concept of like Redwood scaffolding and building out brand new services and features on the fly quite quickly was really important. So in BuildPass's first year, I can't remember, but most of the modules that we see here today were almost scaffolded uh, from just using kind of the, the basic Redwood kind of crud and building out amazing, you know, data entries and forms for uh, BuildPass itself. And we've since then kind of grown out um, the system as well, how we use it, the tooling behind it. Um, you know, some of our services, how we do almost the uh, role-based access we've built on top of that, built it, extended our own versions of that role-based management, all of these things, BuildPass has kind of gone um, beyond. And as I mentioned before, even doing things like audit logs, how we capture the diffs between changes of certain aspects of our um, site itself. Uh, but in doing that, again, all of these things needed scaffolding and quick scaffolding with CRUD and how they interface with one another and you know using GraphQL to our advantage to fetch only what we needed, which is pretty cool. So just before jumping on this call, I checked out how many services we have within Redwood. Um, we're just sitting, sh sitting shy uh, of 100 services, which I think is pretty impressive. So I think we're at 96 services. Um, I didn't look at the schema file for our Prisma. I'm, I'm sh it's That was been uh, without comments. I'm sure it's huge as well. And so we're really kind of pushing Redwood to its limits. So from a, you know, from a scaffolding and from a type point of view and a graphical, all these things where we're hitting no dramas, like we're able to kind of scaffold out all of these different services and, and use them with, you know, the high throughput of workers on site or workers, you know, using the Abin application for the most part. And we're able to do that again, as I said, with mostly vanilla uh, Redwood itself. We've, you know, abstracted a few different things and kind of put our own spin on it as well, which is pretty impressive to get us to the stage. So what's been really awesome is that with, within Redwood itself, we've been able to hire our team of uh, mostly kind of TypeScript full stack developers that can work front end, back end, and just get shit done um, with inside the application as well, which is pretty awesome. So I'd love to kind of show some features really briefly what we'd be able to use. Um, again, some of our smarts, this is mostly potentially showing off some of the Next.js front end, but again, I think it's really worth worthwhile showing that we've been able to build so much just using um, the Redboard application itself. So a big aspect of construction is the concept of template generation, doing everything as a template, you know, going on site, doing a site safety walk, uh, to auditing a bit of uh, you know, construction itself might be a template. And we've built out our own dynamic template language, how we use things like you know, selects and dropdowns and signature block state times, all these things. But the best thing now is as we explore AI is that we don't even need to do that anymore. We can get AI to help us. So I can get them to help generate a quality assurance checklist. Um, and we're building out some pretty cool stuff where we can use, uh, I think this is using, using uh, Anthropic Claude to kind of build out um, some of these checklists um, and doing it in a way that speaks to our common schema that we've built within Redwood. 
um, and then able to then use this template out on site, um, capture these details, store it, and then pull this back out. Um, we need to do some auditing or reporting as well. So we've got that checklist here. Um, all the way through to I would, jumping around to so many modules here, and I can't cover all of these ones off, but I think what's some pretty cool stuff to kind of focus on is how we can use Redwood and do different things to how you might not think. So um, again, when we joined Redwood, there was probably not as much focus on some of the, the, um, the I guess, more asynchronous architecture style of it, um, but we're now looking to how we build out our own version of that. So we're using Redwood functions that can be triggered via you know, off the shelf services like you know, SQS or SNS from AWS or even things like ingest as well, which is a bit more of an asynchronous architecture where you can trigger events. And so we, we can go ahead and build out dynamic workflows um, here. So I go, go ahead and select a particular uh, project. I can say, well, when a checklist has been filled in, so in this case, a electrical safety inspection, um, and when it's created or perhaps when it's completed, I want to then do something um, based on that as well. So building out this event driven or this kind of this, yeah, this idea of triggering something. So we might want to trigger an email. And this in, in, in the industry of construction is really useful for doing things such as a, so perhaps we had a, an, an accident or an injury on site. We then need, need to notify the various you know, safety uh, rep to kind of help uh, to, to review this particular process. And we're able to do this through some asynchronous architecture, again, using Redwood functions um, to build out and trigger various different aspects, send emails out, send um, various workflows and reminders and uh, notifications, which is pretty cool. So yeah, that's that's the, uh, the high level of what we do. Um, as I said, we are growing quite substantially. We are hiring, um, we are looking to go overseas. Um, but what we do is awesome uh awesomely backed by redwood i would say i think for us we've partnered with redwood um both from just the a technology stack but also as a team and community as well so i want to say a big thanks to the team behind redwood itself but you know we wouldn't be able to essentially start build pass um as fast and as efficient as we had and essentially get out of the way of ourselves so get down to building stuff to customers solving customers problems you know, creating tight feedback loops with customers. And we've been able to do that by spinning up, you know, using things like the authentication plugins and the services and the scaffolding and our testing infrastructure all out of the box using Redwood Scaffold and um, building out some really awesome experiences that kind of then wow our customers as well. So that's it, kind of it from the high level demo of what we do at Build Pass. Um, do reach out. I think probably LinkedIn is probably the best way for Aaron Vanston. If you do want to have a, a chat, I'm definitely happy to kind of go through some more detail on some of the technical aspects that I might have covered, whether it be some of the asynchronous architecture here, the audit logging, um, maybe some of the, the role-based or the authorization access that we've been doing to kind of get some of our, our customers, um, the data safe and sound. Definitely happy to kind of explore and showcase some of the stuff that we've done, uh, but very happy to say that we've been able to scale out our Redwood application to, you know, uh, you know, in this case, 100,000 users and to 400 customers Australia-wide. And we're looking to take on the next ch chapter of our uh, kind of our expansion and growth overseas as well. But yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. And yeah, thank you very much. So exciting, right? Thanks again for joining our September town hall. I'd encourage you to take a look at V8. And as always, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Otherwise, we'll catch you again next month.